I'm Yvette Granada, and I am hosting this panel on philosophy and memes. I was invited um, by Foreign Object to be the host, and it has been a really interesting experience, so I hope that you enjoy it. I'm going to start off with an introduction, and it'll be a few minutes, about six minutes, and then the participants will introduce themselves, and then we'll have a discussion of questions um, throughout, and we'll have questions at the end from the people who are joining us. Uh, feel free to also pose questions in the chat along the way, and then we'll have um, time at the end for more discussion. So, all right. <coughs> Okay, so let me move this chat box. Okay, sorry. So the rise of the meme as we know it today has many origin stories. Some say it originated on 4chan. Others claim it came from Reddit. Others say the cultural practice of making memes far precedes the technology of computers or the internet as jokes or catchphrases or repeatable behavior patterns. In the past decade, the meme and meme culture has become a field of study itself. Digital humanities groups have begun to chart the web of meme culture and capture it, such as with the Internet Archives and the Know Your Meme site, dedicated to documenting internet memes and viral phenomena. Perusing the archive of memes over the past two decades on these sites makes one thing clear. Internet memes are not one thing, but contain a multitude of digital subcultures. You will find animal memes, election memes, protest memes, anime memes, emoji memes, creepypasta memes, deep fried memes, Rick and Morty fan memes, doomer memes, boomer memes, and fully automated gay space communist memes. While it seems there is now a meme category for every subculture, there is one category that seems less represented among the internet archives, and that is philosophy memes. The meme makers on this panel today are here to fill this space. Each of the participants has a different take on the art of making memes about philosophy or on the philosophical practice of meme making or on the artistic practice of philosophical memes or on the relation of memeing and philosophizing. As a group as a whole, they are part artist, part philosopher, part theorist, part cultural producer, and part meme, mixed up in various ways. Over the last couple of months, a discussion among the participants has been taking place online on Zoom and on conference calls, discussing their various conceptual approaches and interests in memetic philosophy. I sat in on one of these discussions and listened and learned and asked questions. In this panel today, I'm going to draw out some of the topics of discussion by asking a series of questions to the panel. The questions are based on the conversation and notes that were shared with me from the participants. Without further ado, the participants are Dank Deleuze, who graduated with a BA from UC Berkeley and an MA from the University of Chicago and is coming from a working class background to infiltrate academia from the future. Danko Steven writes extensively on process ontology, poetics, ecology, and abstract economies. That intimate feeling. Gasselman is a multimedia artist and writer who draws inspiration from the chaos of her inner life and the observable world to interrogate the planes of our existence. She graduated from McGill University in 2016 with a degree in Middle East Studies and is currently pursuing her MA. She is a proud survivor and former hostage of the private sector. <laughs> Fake Bifo Berardi is inspired by the writings of media theorist Franco Berardi, especially in the areas of cybernetics, intellectual pessimism, chaos, and communication. Meme love you long time. Started her Instagram account in 2017 to create relatable content about vulnerability, desire, and confronting reductive gender expectations by using Freudian and ethics theory. Now she's an independent scholar interested in the phenomenon of fan communities and how they engage with high and low theories in obvious and discreet ways. Deleuze and Dragons. Luke is a PhD student at Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia in the Department of English. His research interests are the politics of aesthetics, weird fiction, and new wave. He memes as Deleuze and Dragons on Instagram and Dungeons and Repetition second edition on Facebook. Earlier, he posted as Dungeons and Dossian, uh, but has now joined the Potato Gang. 
The philosopher's meme MK24. Philo meme is a computer scientist who started his page in high school. His primary interests are in German idealism, existentialism, and computing theory and its implications. Beyond woke and problematic, grew out of a renewed interest in continental philosophy after and the potential for its dissemination through memes. Mostly, it's a creative outlet to make groups around philosophers and their ideas. And Meta Spinoza, the host of Thousand Grujo, a meme page which has been characterized as pessimist realism, pretentious lunacy, and cocaine as philosophy, bad for your health, but a lot of fun. Besides this, Meta Spinoza is currently working on a monograph called Neo Leviathan about the future of statecraft on a warming planet. Okay, so now um, the panelists will all take a couple of minutes to talk about their meme pages and introduce their work to us. Who should we start with? Oh, well, let's go with you. Ah, I walked into that one. Got him. Uh, got him. <laughs> um, I, uh, my meme page is uh, primarily a mode of therapy for myself uh, that I didn't uh, really mean to become a meme page that anyone looked at. Uh, it uh, was supposed to function kind of like uh, Deleuze and Guattari's Le Board, uh, where the schizophrenics and the doctors work together in order to, uh, I don't know, do something, figure something out, produce creative, uh, using their desiring production, fix the ruptures in their psyches. And it hasn't helped at all. Um, I, uh, Dorian is, uh, thank Deleuze. Um, I forgot to change my name on here. Now everyone knows who I am. I've been self-doxed. Um, but uh, I would describe most of my uh, stuff that I put up on there as libidinous, deterritorializing hysteria. Uh, and it changes a little bit every day. I don't know what I'm doing, but people seem to like it. Thanks. I like it. Oh. <laughs> Desiring production really goes. That's <laughs> all I do. Thank you for your next time. Um, hi, everybody. I um, I run the meme page, uh, Fake Beef Berardi, which um, is kind of also a form of, I think, autotherapy. It's just kind of a receptacle of um, <clears throat> whatever kind of theories I'm reading or interrogating or interested in at a certain time. Kind of, uh, yeah, it, it was uh, spawned from quarantine by myself for four months and kind of getting slowly more and more um, deterritorialized into the world of Theorygram, getting to know some of the admins of other uh, meme pages on Theorygram. Um, and then I since then have just kind of been making semi clever observations over uh, washed out sci fi vintage art since then. Um, but yeah, generally interested with um, a, a kind of philosophical pessimism and toying with an idea of philosophical quietism in the, this age of over overly produced uh, signs and symbols. That's me. <laughs> I'll jump in because I, I, I'll, I'll, otherwise I will spend the whole time thinking I should sort of end the silence each time. Um, so I'm just going to get the hell out of the way. Uh, so I run Thousand Grigor, um, infamously unpronounceable. And uh, it basically, so originally, right, it was going to be uh, like just the sort of anti-Civ meme page. And the profile picture was originally Gutari's head uh, photoshopped onto a caveman. And I made it and then I didn't touch it for like, a month and instagram would occasionally notify me like someone liked your dumb posts on this page you never look at and so i was like well i'm bored so i'll start putting things on there and for some reason it got quite large i think almost all of my followers probably come from the philosopher's meme uh but after a while it turned into its own sort of eco-pessimist propaganda machine which i feel like is largely what i'm known for if not just being a sort of horrible cantankerous grump which i promise i'm actually not despite the uh 
the general tenor of the page. Uh, but I can't say mine is actually therapy for me. If anything, running it keeps me more inflamed than when I spent most of my time just sort of chilling and reading. But it is a lot of fun. And uh, meeting most of you, as in I've met most of you, not there are some of you I don't like. I mean, meeting most of you has been nice over the last couple of months. And those of you who I haven't met, uh, I'm sure you're also very nice. That's that's my terrible intro. All right. Can you clarify if Grigel is correct? So it's it's Grugo. Okay. Um it's it's Thousand Grugo and it's I, I get asked a lot what it like what that name is. Um and I usually lie when asked that question. It purely is, as I say, it was originally just gonna be like a jokey uh, civilization bad page, which it is, but it's more than that now. Um, the point was like Plateau, Thousand Plateau, Grugo, Grug the Caveman, that's it. It's the worst possible name for a meme page. If I'd known how big it was get, I would have spent more than three seconds naming it, but I'm just, I'm stuck a bit now. Thank you. Um, I'll go uh, next. Oh, okay. I am Meme Love You Long Time, and my, I'll talk about my name first, actually. So, um, I love Stanley Kubrick and Full Metal Jacket, but obviously there's that scene um, with the Vietnamese woman. And so that phrase to me, me love you long time, was just so like emblematic of the tensions that I have as someone who really enjoys like auteur culture, which also extends to kind of like the auteurship of philosophy and theory, if you will. Um, and then how to enjoy that as like a woman of color. And so I really wanted to engage with that on my main page and especially with the notion of like, um, femininity and desire. So I wanted to use this page as a way to destabilize notions of femininity and desire and also to connect that um, or to like show that it's not necessarily anti-intellectual because a lot of people kind of like have that binary. Um, and I think it kind of oscillates from being very like accessible content that doesn't have a lot of like really heavy lingo and then sometimes like incorporating um, kind of heavier theory that I use. And so the other kind of objective behind the page, besides kind of working through my own stuff, like theoretical, emotional, whatever, um, is to think about, um, I guess, um, making memes and or making philosophy more accessible through memes and through pop culture. Um, that's why sometimes I use like um, Gossip Girl and Twilight to work through ideas about like affect theory. Ooh. I just say, right. whoever has crickets chirping in the background, I love you. It's so appropriate <laughs> for this. I think that would be me uh, doing this outside on my porch. Uh, anyway, I guess I'll go next since I'm already talking. Uh, <clears throat> Beyond Woke and Problematic. Um, if you haven't figured out, it's play on Beyond Good and Evil by Bridget Nietzsche. Uh, Philosopher uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, very misunderstood um, by you know, people all over the political spectrum. Uh, but yeah, I like many of the other panelists, uh, I kind of started this out as like, uh, kind of like uh, just a way to wrap my head around these ideas and these philosophers I've been reading. And it ended up just me making jokes. And um, yeah, here I am now. And I Basically, I just argue with people on Twitter uh, <laughs> and I make memes about it. But um, yeah, it's, it, I don't know, it's, uh, a, it's a way of disseminating theory and these ideas I'm interested in and making affective connections with the, the follower. Uh, and uh, if you follow my page, I'm very into Deleuze and Guattari, uh, Batai, uh, Nick Land. I started out as just kind of a mocking him, but um, as time grew on, I kind of agree with a lot of his things and end up defending him, even though he's like, uh, you know, a reactionary crank. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you all for, for doing this. All right. Um. <laughs> I was about to awkwardly step in, so I'll just walk through that door and say, like explain myself in the dumbest way possible is, you know, in, in some sense, I think I began the page, you know, as a, you know, as a faux Heideggerian or a pseudo Heideggerian, still don't get the, 
any of it except for the sort of you know hellenic uh neo teutonic aspect of it let's say you know it was the, the, the main pages in some sense you know the i'll try and slow down sorry uh, uncovering the philosophy so i i don't reading Heidegger is so terribly difficult. So if I can meme it, maybe I can uncover it in the sense of, you know, the tree that conceals the chair or something. Now, eventually this becomes, you know, okay, I, this is no one incomprehensible enough. Why not Deleuze? Um, and then this is meant to be in some sense, okay, well, I really enjoy this group becoming, maybe I've misunderstood it, but there's this participatory nature of, uh, this may, maybe we we'll talk about later, but the participatory nature of memeing Deleuze in some sense, it's not just that I'm finding out what it is. I think it's like it was. It felt like philosophy escaping itself through the meme is partially, I think, sort of what's going on in something like a thousand plateaus. So that was that's that's sort of something I'm still doing. But then I find that it's 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 less about memes now than just blanking out walls of text on faded backgrounds and saying, "Hey guys, this is this is a meme now." I guess so. I've deterritorialized. You know, this is actually me doing the most, uh, you know, eloquent and wonderful Deleuzean practice that there possibly could be. You know, I've, I've escaped out the other side of politics in some sense by just withdrawing into this gloomy onanism. Um, so, and I think that's really what the page is now. It's just, it's sort of, it's not my therapy. It's my public, uh, my public, you know, break or breakthrough. I'll just say breakthrough. So I'm not sure if any of that tracks, but that's definitely what I feel like I'm doing at the moment. I love that you use the word onanism. Which is a, <laughs> an excellent word that should be used way more. It's on, it's 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 onanistic in itself, I think, which is um, a bit scary. <laughs> I uh, really quick thing. I know we're trying to do in introductions, but uh, I think uh, so many people have have mentioned so far, and I, I suspect we'll mention more. Uh, both a desiring onanistic masturbatory uh, quality to this as well as a therapeutic quality. Uh, but uh, if, if Freud and Lacan have taught us anything, it's that therapy's not always good for you and that masturbation's not necessarily bad. So the, uh, we should consider both the onanistic and the therapeutical uh, attributes of these things maybe in uh, 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 looser categories that can swap sides as we go forward. Just a food for thought. Thank you. I was hungry. <laughs> and uh, really happily to follow that. Uh, uh, I'm Yasmin from That Intimate Feeling. And uh, so I, it seems like the endeavor sprung out from my desire to have a basis for the audio project that I had. And the title of my page also comes from, from that where my radio hero uh, said something in an interview about uh, that intimate feeling that radio creates. And so it kind of sprung from that and they needed a platform to um, popularize my show. And I thought, okay, why not do that through memes? And even though the memes that I make don't necessarily have anything to do with the show that I produce. Um, it seems now that it's become just a process of me interrogating um, my own ideas of things that I'm reading about and thinking about and in the process alienating as many people I know in real life as possible. So that's been really fun and uh, antithetical to the therapeutic nature of it maybe, but also maybe dead weight, I don't know, that probably <laughs> <laughs> any favors, but at this point, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's about it. Dead weight. <laughs> I'm dead now. <laughs> Is that everyone? Or yeah. Are you yeah. Last person, I think uh, I'm probably the last one left, so. Nah. Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> That's all good. Yeah, so I'm a philosopher's meme. I, as it was like mentioned earlier, I started this meme page probably in high school. Actually, ironically, the, the page name had nothing to do with intellectualism or philosophy at its conception. Conception. It was actually literally a reference to Harry Potter, and it just kind of became this kind of thing where uh, the call came from people asking me to post philosophy memes, and I started doing that. And I started getting more interested in that probably towards the end of my high school and then going to college. 
and I kind of, I guess, deter uh, deterritorialize the page in a, in a sense. And now it comes kind of a, a general academic topic page at this point. Yeah, now Harry Potter cringe, right? <laughs> You're in trouble now, man. You shouldn't have said it. I was going to say something. <laughs> you know, actually uncontroversial. Sorry. Okay. That is about to be uh, the <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, everyone. Um, I'm going to pose the first question and anyone can answer. So what is a meme author? Who do memes belong to? Who or where do meme authors belong? Who has the responsibility of translating memes or of translating in memes or translating memes? And are memes or meme pages conceptual persona? Persona. So to answer on a very literal level, who owns or who, who do the memes belong to? If you take like a pro proprietary interpretation of that question and kind of what highlights, I think some of the undergirding uh, sensation of, of onanism or futility or, you know, spinning against the wind is that at the end of the day, um, all of this is the intellectual property of the platform that we are memeing on. So in the, for the, in the case of most of us, that would be Instagram. So like on a very literal basis of ownership, the memes belong to the platform capitalists and to the, to the corporations. But if you want to do a charitable interpretation, I think it just, I mean, my, my short answer of like, who are the viewers and consumers of this kind of uh, very niche esoteric content, I would have to say, um, if I were being uncharitable, just pseudo intellectuals, and if I were being charitable, people who are really interested and um, perhaps new or, or rediscovering this kind of very uh, nebulous field of like, just a huge range of philosophy. I mean, most of us probably deal with more um, postmodern, post-structuralist and, and, you know, literary theory types, but there are also you know, within this kind of milieu, which I'm sure will be fleshed out later, you know, um, classical philosophy, empiricism, analytic, you know, so it, it is very much like um, it belongs to uh, anyone who wants to, you can, you know, click on the wrong hashtag and see one of our memes. But uh, I think the, the kind of like, I wouldn't say community, but the kind of the, the infosphere surrounding us is, is primarily uh, pseudo intellectuals, yeah. Oh yeah, Poma belongs to the Sudes. I think that this this question of belonging sort of as it relates to like say the, the genre like wh whether it's you know what we're doing as as suits or whatever you know particular gang we say we affiliate with or cult um, as I would think of it it's you know I think these it's too mobile a format I think to speak of belonging so you might say you know they're enduring um they're enduring formats but I think even the idea of the meme as such like we've raced so far away from that. We might say, well, who does the meme belong to? Well, I say, do, well, do we belong to memes? I'd almost say clearly no, but maybe. <laughs> um, and, and, and say there's this like sort of the way that memes move, it's, it's, it's already walking away from the pack construction. It's certainly walking away from, you know, the molar or, you know, a, a cohesive group. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's too molecular, it's too mobile to, to, to properly... Um, speak of belonging, and I think that's like maybe stupidly abstract and not not useful because we, maybe we do want to talk about. You know, I, I think once I did get shitty with someone for um, you know for stealing my memes, and you know that was when I was reading t too much Heidegger, not enough. You know, thinking about identities and uh, belonging. You know, and, and I always think Heidegger and belonging. What what do I belong to? I do do I belong to my Germanness? Do I belong to being? Well, if, if, if we're thinking in terms of becoming, and I think memes are essentially a matter of becoming, they're consistently evolving. Um, it, yeah, the speak of belonging can only be this momentary relation and then it's gone. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a durational uh, uh, belonging. When I say it best, I don't mean this to, to value. I'm just, I'm trying to uh, qualify it um, in some less abstract sense, but it's this relational, maybe hopefully it's a relation without transaction. That then moves variably. Um, sorry, that was. I'm seeing some people say, you know, this is. <laughs> it's not providing useful information, and that's probably just made it much worse. But I'm repping for the suits really hard right now. 
<laughs> I'm going to say right now, um, all of the memes are actually mine. As <laughs> as a Sternerite, they're just mine. Um, I think the thing about suits. I think that Theorygram has an interesting preoccupation with the idea of being a suit, and I don't really understand why, because I feel like essentially what that must rely on is some standard by which we say this person is a pseudo-intellectual and this person isn't a pseudo-intellectual because they, they've hit the, the particular barrier of knowing. It's interesting because philosophy to me is a practice of really not knowing anything at all and attempting to grasp at knowing something. I know it's this kind of ironic self-effacement that many of us feel compelled to do because we simultaneously proclaim that we know things from our podiums, but we also don't want to be accused of seeming like we know too much. But I do think it's an ironic disavowal because evidently we must think that we have something interesting to say, otherwise we wouldn't bother with the pages. Um, I know that's actually not an answer to the original <laughs> question. Uh, but I have always found it interesting how often we throw the word sued around. I suspect many of us don't really think we're suits at all. Um, and if we do, I'm sorry that you feel that way. You probably aren't. I mean, I think... to me at least, the way that, I mean, I've seen people who are a bit, um, perhaps more naive, use it as an insult, but for me, it, it's kind of become a, a loving term of affection because as you say, you know, there's this kind of Socratic impulse to admit once you've kind of like swam in the soup of the text long enough that the only thing you know is nothing. But then, as you say, the person who is attributed uh, to that quote, Socrates, would never shut the fuck up. So obviously, like you say, there was a, a you know, there is some uh, aspiration to either uh, demonstrate knowledge or, or seek knowledge. So I see Sood as, as a very... Uh, in gear reclaiming the slur. Yeah, reclaiming the slur. <laughs> I, I, I think it's also kind of like the, the, the four da game, right? Where we refer to ourselves or to others as suds um, with the uh, maybe not express intention, uh, but with the intention that they will return to us uh, and they will say, no, you're not you're not, you're not ugly. Your ass doesn't look huge in, in those yeah, pants. You know, uh, nice and, and that you will in turn uh, kind of uh, give them a little bit of that. Uh, or you can both be suits together and commiserate. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of it is just this kind of back and forth where it's, it is an ironical kind of thing, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think the, the suit thing is both because some of us probably I mean, I, I've certainly never gotten a question I thought was dumb, uh, but I feel like a lot of us probably get a lot of uh, questions in our DMs that we think are kind of dumb. Uh, and so we feel harassed sometimes by people that may be referred to as suits, especially if they don't like the answer that you give them. Uh, but uh, I think that there's also something in, involved in this where there's the, the parasocial relationship that you're building, which is based on everyone with this weird imposter syndrome and also this this false humbleness that ironically kind of pushes up against it and it's uh we're all suits man we're all suits I'm not i think that the idea though of like this false humbleness um mm. is related to the idea of ownership of memes i think that some of us like to think that we own our memes in a certain way um but i also think that memes are kind of built on a culture of stealing like i think that all of us use like we're using texts from other people whether they're from current theorists or like old philosophers and then we're using art and images from other people and then kind of combining it and i guess the form itself is like this hybridity and it's ironic because we're making use and we're appropriating other things and i think that's kind of resisting the culture of like you know, individualism and making things from scratch, but then at the same time, we like to claim ownership, or not all of us necessarily, but I think that there is this kind of like, oh, I made this meme, like someone stole my meme, but also like, you also stole that meme from someone else. But I think it's all very like, you know, even in addition to that kind of stealing culture, it doesn't really belong to us at the end of the day, like fake beef said, that it's like, you know, it belongs to the platform that you're posting it on. And so it's like kind of, ephemeral and indefinite in that way but then I guess you can also say that like the memes belong to the people so it's kind of like well yeah I mean like I think that... oh sorry are you finished what oh that's done yeah what, what Luke was talking about how uh, um, 
you know, memes are very molecular and they move at their own pace and they, you know, kind of have a, a rate of dissemination. It's like when you do begin, when you realize that there is no property in cyberspace that you possess, that you can lay claim to, I mean, even the term stealing becomes, you know, um, inapplicable because theft implies, a, you know, a, a violation of property rights that we just simply don't have as, you know, producers of content or whatever on, on the internet. And so like even the, the term mimesis, which has existed as a concept for, you know, thousands of years, which is, you know, the, the mimicry and copying and the reproduction of forms and of symbols. Um, I mean, it's like, it, it, it is, yeah, like, like as we kind of referred to earlier, the idea of a mean belonging or, or, or of the kind of, um, kind of possessive, na possessive attitude that we can have towards our quote unquote creations I think it's just a holdover from meat space, which will eventually be um, in the long term, if we're anticipating a kind of um, virtualization and, and uh, uh, connectedness of human communication, you know, outside of the embodied uh, area of speech and body language, I think like we'll ultimately just see more and more of a, of a kind of dissolution of this idea of of the, of the personal possessive or the personal possession or something like that. And that's not to say like a kind of Antonio Negri uh, intellectual communism or anything like that, more so a kind of like um, great flattening of cybernetic slavery. <laughs> I, I, we, go, I do. we go from, oh, sorry, I was going to say we go from my mesis to me mesis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, um, so Yasmin's the intimate, dealing with the intimate relates to this. You also talked about interrogation and alienation. And I feel the sort of topic of alienation coming up with the discussion of uh, ownership and also suits. So I wonder, you, know, you have a bit of a different way of describing what you do. How do you see this in relation to intimacy and um, alienation? So it's interesting that the uh, the idea of how much of it do we own? Is it the platform? Is it ourselves or the audience? Um, I found out very intimately how much I don't own my memes when uh, one that I made around the time of the protests um, happening in, I think it was like March or April, um, called Diversity is Gay, where I questioned the idea of um, heteronormative yeah, heteronormativity in society and that sort of thing. And uh, it ended up being appropriated by a bunch of uh, pages on Facebook and Fortune that are a bit more, um, uh, I, I hate the word alt-right, but I guess like you could just like describe it as kind of fash. And uh, they blurred out my watermark that I put on it very lovingly and then it just kind of like took on a life of its own and then I realized that my attachment to it even though I made it during a process where um, again I was like interrogating my own ideas of how I felt about the way that things were you know kind of playing out publicly in the political sphere it was kind of just like taken and yanked and you know used to justify or rationalize certain schools of thought that I didn't necessarily agree with myself despite uh, the appearance of the meme itself. So that's been an interesting process, just kind of like grappling with the, um, yeah, with, with the notion of ownership. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that, so the, both the, the value and the identification uh, or, or the ownership of a meme is largely defined by um, how it's taken from you or received by someone else and returned to you in a lot of ways. Uh, like the, the, what most of us are doing on on these meme pages uh some people are more creative and produce these cool videos and stuff uh like uh, like yesman does but uh the rest of us largely take a pre-existing image uh and then uh shop on some some faces and some new text and stuff so we're taking it from something else to return something to what we've taken right and then inside of these larger uh, meme communities and of the internet as a whole which is horrifying uh, there is this this constantly throwing shit into the void, and the best thing that could happen 
is that it somehow returns to you after making its rounds through the internet uh, while still holding on to the intended meaning. Uh, and the worst thing that could happen isn't even necessarily that there's no exchange, there's no Fort Da thing, you don't throw it out of your cradle and have it handed back to you. It's not that it just disappears, it's that it returns to you in some, some uh, adulterated, bastardized way, which is really the more likely way of any of these exchanges occurring. Um, but there's, there's a tension that develops there with, with the ownership because um, it, it intensifies the ownership in some way that it returns to you in a way that is uh, totally not yours anymore, that it, it has a totally different meaning to it. It has a totally different identification. And somehow that makes it, for me, maybe I'm just an incredibly guilt-driven person that feels I'm very misunderstood. Uh, but uh, as soon as something returns to me that has been identified in a new way, uh, I feel almost as if, as if I, I should have a, a tighter grip on it and that I should have owned it better or described it better. Uh, but that my inability to hold on to it kind of makes it more mine uh, in, a, in an awful way. Um, I, do, I do think that um, what you're describing and the fear of your work getting taken out of context has, um, I guess, implications for and, and limits in terms of like the amount of irony that you can use. Like, because I think that probably a lot of us, we kind of function on irony. It's like the main um, feature or like aesthetic of our memes. But when it's in a different um, like location or group or community, then it's completely taken out of context. And the other thing is that so many different like niches on Instagram and just like on social media in general use like varying degrees of irony. Sometimes it's like completely ironic. Sometimes it's like half ironic. And so I think that sometimes like now I feel the need to go out of my way in like the caption. If I have like an ironic meme, then I go out of my way to make sure that I'm like describing quite literally what's happening. Um, because I'm afraid that people are going to take it way out of context. But then again, like people will still do that. So, yeah, right. The I kind of come to accept personally that, you know, once you post something, and I think it's this, this thing concept of ownership in general is when something is posted out into cyberspace, especially because of the nature of memes, they exist in the perception of others to, towards a long, large extent. So I think like once you post that as something, you just don't have control over it. I mean, like, and like in really almost an extent, you kind of like uh, depersonalize yourself. I mean, like a meme can travel so many different ways. And after a while, it might come back to you eventually, but most of the time it can be used in so many different formats. Like imagine being the guy that invented like that boy. And like, we'll never know who came up with some of these like random things that just caught on like wildfire. So I think when it comes to ownerships, I don't think memes really belong to anyone as much as they belong towards, uh, I guess, a mythos personally. Right. It, 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 so they I belong... have a timer. Okay. Uh, for our topics, and we're all we're all past the time on this topic, so I'm going to move our conversation along, and incorporate. I'm going to incorporate some of them. There's a lot of questions um, from people already, so I'm going to incorporate some questions as I ask my questions. So we'll go to the next topic now. Sorry to cut you off. Um, so why or how and why does ph philosophy fit well with memes for you? Um, that's one, um, an audience question. Can you really do philosophy through memes? And then why does Deleuze and Guattari fit so well with memes? And explain Deleuze to me or I'll fucking kill you. I, I think I you definitely can do. Oh, what the do fuck you wanna... does doing philosophy mean? Yeah. <laughs> It's it's in the book called What is Philosophy, Dorian? Yeah. It's, oh, shit. The answer's right there. <laughs> philosophy, according to the Luz, is the creation of memes. <laughs> Minds of flight, a.k.a. memes. You know, that's all he's talking about. Right. I think that's you cool. can do philosophy through memes because yeah. philosophy has always been the simple practice of screaming at people um, that they're wrong and you're right over and over again until they go away. And a meme page simply turns this process into its most efficient form by giving you not only a platform that grows over time, but the unlimited right to ban anyone you don't like from responding to you, thus creating a full domain of I'm right and you're wrong, I'm right and you're wrong. Um, and that is actually my semi-serious answer because I think that it really is a little bit idealist to think that philosophy is truly about dialogue or interaction. In a lot of ways, it is merely 
yes, the production of concepts, the elaboration of thoughts and ideas, and then presenting them in a way that is palatable. So I may be a little cynical in my understanding of um, what philosophy ultimately is in that regard. But I think insofar as they're ultimately platforms for presenting an idea or ideas, engaging in discourse if you should like to, but nonetheless reserving to yourself the right to simply spout off. And the fact that that then has the effect, not of brainwashing other people, but of them then reading something else, thinking about it, discussing it with their friends. I had someone message me a little while ago saying that a friend of theirs showed them a meme of mine and they'd never discussed Thousand Grigo in person. And then they had a conversation about it. I had someone else say to me they'd read something I'd written and discussed it with their mum. So I do think that you absolutely can engage in this process through memes, although you may not necessarily engage in it in the way you would in, say, a seminar or an agora or in some academy. It's certainly a different space. And I think, like, memes do create concepts and mythos as they go on. I mean, if you look at, like, the Doomer versus the Doomer meme, it's not that there aren't you know, existential uh, takes that people make and, you know, the idea that, like, uh, there's a black bill and then, like, once you take that, you realize, like, everything is meaningless or, you know, the boomer is, like, the, like, the critiquing of social relationships. There's definitely people that have created, like, kind of uh, frameworks in people's minds that's not very different from philosophy. Like, say, like, you know, the, that crackhead, like, in the Agora that's talked about, like, uh, you know, whether or not they know anything or what justice is. <laughs> I think one of the primary like obvious differences is visuality and I think that a lot of people might see that as being like a reduction of philosophy like you're just making things simplified but I think that it actually you can also see it as taking removing philosophy from this very like heavily textual context which can be really inaccessible for a lot of people because of like time money etc um, and so I think that even though it's not long passages that people are doing like heavy analysis of through like writing it is a different way to think about philosophy and i also think just like the practical level of the fact that we're using um social media makes it accessible to a lot of people like obviously academia is very is very very like much an ivory tower um and is super inaccessible for a lot of people but i think that even just like posting content can um but then also it's like, how are we disseminating this information? How is what we're doing? If it's like, quote unquote, wrong, is that right that we're spreading it to people? And maybe their view of philosophy is not, um, is like, I don't know, quotes that are not right or something. Um, just kind of on that, when you're talking about uh, how to disseminate and, and this kind of like, perhaps this represents a kind of liberation from the text of the concept. Although obviously there's still text involved in most of our memes, you know, it's, it's the combination of an image and um, a commentary or a citation or a quote. But I do think that um, this idea of kind of like the, the changing of the medium is very important and kind of seems to be kind of a strange atavism of, you know, something that was presumed to uh, have been dying as, you know, with the rise of kind of like, the epistemological uh, questioning of postmodernity, um, the transition to the info age, uh, you know, instantaneous access to information, but also this kind of what, what Jameson calls like this total flow, you know, like there, there, there are no, and also Deleuze talks about this as well uh, in uh, Postscript on Society of Controls, there, uh, the, the demarcation um, that was present in modern society, like, uh, you know, you, read a text from beginning to end, or you uh, read a pamphlet, or, you know, the novel as the high form of art of modernity. Now you just have this constant, incessant flow of uh, psycho-visual stimulation. And like, I think the format of, uh, of Instagram particularly is exactly that, you know, you're, you're constantly going through a stream of these, um, micro concepts or these representation of con concepts, usually humorous, many very inane, uh, some, you know, more uh, interactive or, or engaging than others. But it is, you know, nobody's just going to like, oh, I'm going to check uh, if there's a new meme on the Philosopher's Meme 2K or whatever, and like go and check and then be like, oh, that was humorous and put the phone away. It's, you know, it is a very processual, uh, uh, interaction with the, with these kinds of concepts, which I mean, I think 
goes beyond just philosophy as a discipline, but, you know, for this particular context is, you know, relevant that it is just kind of like this, um, yeah, this, this inundation and this kind of like almost oversaturation of uh, this kind of multimedia assemblage. And it's like, can you do philosophy that way? I mean, it depends, it really depends on your level of interaction um, with the pages themselves, with, you know, what's referenced in the memes. Um, I mean, it's very easy just to kind of like, be like, oh shit, that's Nick Land. He's the funny guy from Twitter who said something about like robots or something. And then like, go no further or, you know, just kind of like become comfortable with recognizing the signifiers that like refer to a certain school of thought or philosopher or whatever. So I don't know, it's ambiguous to me. I think so, this comment I, from Scott is really good. That, sorry, I, I just wanted to point out the comment and then go ahead, shoot. I just, I, I thought this was good. I love that it's in bite-sized chunks I can chew on when I'm busy or stressed. I just don't have the patience or clearness of mind at times to pick up an actual book, probably partially because I'm addicted to my phone, but still. I think that's a great point, that it is a way of making philosophy a practice you can kind of do. I mean, most people, if you work a nine or 10 hour shift each day, four or five days a week, do you really have time for this? The answer is you might. Um, but I think that's a good point that it presents a way of making philosophy accessible, as ghoulish as that word often can be. Yeah, that's why I mean, that's where my bone to pick is that kind of that specifically that word, because it's like, are you making it accessible? Or are you being reductive? You know, that's always the debate about, you know, intellectual clarity and, and public intellectualism. I think this idea of, say, accessibility in, say, bite-sized chunks, and I, I'm not trying to dismiss that this is, in some sense, you can get a bite-sized chunk and it will give you a chunk to think on, but certainly digesting it, I don't think, is the point of doing philosophy. So, you know, I, th I think, you know, some of us, more or less, are posting things that are incredibly obscure and they might not just be obscure because we've read these you know relatively arcane texts they might also also be because our reactions to these texts are in some sense you know obscure in their own way possibly even um to us and i think this is sort of this is the role of philosophy is it's not to play the sage in to say ah oh, here is the answer ever it's to say uh, it's to do problematics it's to do pragmatics it's to engage at this you know visceral level almost so I, I like the idea of it's a bite-sized chunk that's a very that's a very visceral um, thing to say but then to expect digestion I think which I think is a big critique of like you're not doing philosophy I don't understand you haven't told me um like and not even in the sense but you know this sort of analytic sense of you've given me a truth set that I can see works out or it might also be you've given me the wisdom you know you've given me the answer to you know, can a philosopher, what, what is, what is your philosophy of climate change? And they expect, you know, um, they expect some uplifting words. Like they expect, they expect the eco-pessimism version of live, laugh, love. And this is not, this is not the, the goal of philosophy. So I'm, I worry about bite-sized chunks. I also love the fact that we're chewing. Um, but so that, that, that constant chewing, much like the constant, you know, aforementioned onanism is that's, I think, yeah, we absolutely can get at this. Um, with philosophy, it's just that maybe I think when people think of what is philosophy, they they and maybe I'm just being quite rude about people. But I don't I do think they think that philosophy is answers and answers to problems rather than this horrible set of processes that were that that are sort of maybe ruining our lives in some sense. Um, right. Yeah. The uh, the the chewing metaphor I, I think works really well here. Uh, but uh, so. Rather than viewing memes as something that's reductive, like little notes that you take on a subject and then say, well, Nick Land likes robots, is racist on Twitter, and I don't know how to go fast, uh, and then that's a meme, I, the, the way that I uh, kind of view it, maybe optimistically, is that it works similarly to poetry, right? Uh, which sounds pretentious, but hear me out. Uh, so the... The German word for poetry is dichte, right? Which, which can mean to dictate, but it can also mean to thicken, right? Like a sauce, you're thickening a sauce, you're getting rid of all the other stuff, and then you have something that contains all of it that you can kind of Im imbibe at once, right? So when I make a meme, there's a reason that it's not generally, sometimes it is, 
a picture of Nick Land on a robot body, uh, it ends up being, here's a picture of, well, like one I, that I made earlier today, or maybe it was yesterday, I don't know how time works anymore. Uh, but, you know, you have a picture of uh, Negri, uh, and then you have him painting Spinoza, who is painting someone while Deleuze sits naked in the middle of the room. And that's not a simplification of anything. That doesn't make anything easier. These aren't little notes that you put at the bottom of something. It's a thickening of concepts. It's, 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 it's producing the space where th things are problematized and maybe ambiguated, but made more complicated. And, and in a lot of ways you do need, uh, you can simplify it to being just like, I have these signifiers and I kind of understand that these things are supposed to make me chuckle when they are together and so they do, but you also have the opportunity to produce more complex subjects and, and ideas without having to write the whole paper on it, which maybe is ruining my writing, uh, but I think that it works well uh, in this, this framework, this fabric. Uh, because I, and I'll, I'll finish after this, but the, 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 the way that I view philosophy is that it, it isn't necessarily a, a form of discrete inquiry with any kind of goals. I, I like the idea of it being a process. Luke knows how I feel about process. Uh, but it's, it's a lattice where all other intellectual inquiry and, and being kind of floats in. It, 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 is this space where everything else becomes clarified or, or questioned, right? Uh, and, and philosophy can fit into any space between any disciplines or any portion of human experience. And it's just this frayed space that we haven't made sense of yet. Uh, and by interacting with that nonsense or that over thickening or that reduction uh, and trying to make it fit with everything else, that's how we make sense of other fields. Uh, and so, yeah, let's make little questions in a picture, and then you, it's a cool question picture. And there you go. That's philosophy. Yeah. I, I think I, another thing too is that, like, is especially like the under twenty-two demographic. I think the primary way they really analyze things now is not through like books or uh, you know, writing papers or making movies. I think primarily it's through the uh, creation of these images. I mean, if you look at like how your average like twenty, say like eighteen, sixteen, seventeen-year-olds is like interacting with the world around them. It's primarily they're pointing this out in like some image or like you know some Twitter thing that has like deep fried like image of Squidward or something. So I mean I I don't think that's like you can't not analyze things with memes personally as well. Like and then like I don't think like a philosophy meme essentially like would come and like give you an answer or give you a point either. Like I feel like it's not actually a meme. Well, sometimes we'll have you do more work uh, to understand it than just uh, just reading a passage or something. Kind of. On that, if any, if no one else wants to interject, just kind of as a rejoinder to what Dorian was saying, um, bringing it, it poetry into you know our, our um, questioning about the subject is you know Berardi talks about poetry in one of his uh, uh, mid works uh, on poetry and finance, and basically how he encapsulates it as a form of conveying meaning which ex escapes the language of exchangeability, which he kind of defines as the operative mode of um, online uh, interaction and also what can constitutes uh, finance and the code that comprises the web itself. You know, there are these, um, these functions which uh, are always equivalent to, to some other uh, value or information and it, it is a code which ends up kind of um, describing or tr to trying to describe uh, a total system. Poetry being a way of using language, science, and symbols to, to uh, invoke or, or uh, imply or even just kind of, kind of rouse, the, rouse the spirit, if you will, of uh, another sensible being, like you know, a sensitive being in the world. Um, but I, I, I'm tempted, I, and I see where, what you're talking about with the thickening of the concepts and, you know, you know oftentimes these little um, morsels or, or bite-sized chunks or whatever are quite, you know, uh, take a lot to digest. And there is a lot of layers of meaning which aren't evidently exchangeable, you know. But I'm Frequently also, totally undigestible, just to clarify. <laughs> it's not totally... Better going in than coming out, yeah. yeah sometimes um, it just doesn't happen. 
but, but the other thing is like this idea of semi-inflation, and that's something that also is very attractive to me about Berardi, which is this idea that as uh, with the dawn of the uh, in, info age and, you know, instantaneous access to all, you know, most recorded human texts, as well as platforms like Twitter, which basically uh, exists to coax people into literally shitting their thoughts onto the internet, you have um, just this insane amount of saturation of signs and symbols and images. And Berardi's hypothesis is that, you know, as this proliferation continues, there is a kind of inflating effect on what's actually conveyed. And so, you know, if you're saying the meme is a language of non-exchangeability, something that doesn't fit within the kind of like economistic flows of language, which would be subject to inflation, I don't know. I, I feel like there's still, there is still this sense that, you know, the more that's produced, the less um, potency these kinds of, I don't know, art objects or, or images or whatever you want to call them have. And so like that may be, I don't know, one of the comments was from another fellow, uh, the ecstasy of communication commented that uh, Dorian's interpretation of memes was incredibly optimistic, you know, as, as hopefully uh, kind of provoking you're you're not a, or you're shaking your head but yeah i don't know I, I feel like we have to kind of keep not get ahead of ourselves so i want to interject there because i was going to move on to the next question um we're past the time for this one but i also wanted to bring in um things from the chat and i was looking at the the comment about the optimism um, and there's some questions in the Q&A questions about um, politics. And this relates to a question that I have here already about memes and ideology. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the relationship between memes and ideology. Do memes encapsulate ideology? And also, um, I have a question particularly for meme love you long time and confronting um, reductive gender expectations. I think that fits nicely in with this um, part of the discussion as well. Um, okay, yeah, I'll start. So I think that um, in general, I think that there's this maleness that we associate with um, like high theory. And even though there's a lot of new forms of theory that are more um, like not to be protective, but to use the word inclusive, like affect theory and um, uh, gender theory, et cetera. I think that um, we still see this idea of feelings as being like anti-intellectual. And so um, I think that's kind of part of the reason. And also, I guess I would also say that I think that there's just an attitude of like knowing everything that is also kind of masculinized too, that I sometimes see. And I think that um, part of my idea about destabilizing these gender roles was to promote an idea of like um, accessibility and not knowing everything. Like I think that, you know, that kind of position is often feminized, like not saying that, you know, all women are, um, you know, inclusive and accessible, et cetera. But just that I think being open and inclusive is tended, is often undervalued because it's feminized. So that's why I kind of wanted to bring together like things that are seen as basic, like Gossip Girl, Twilight, and now I've been using like K-pop stuff too, um, because those are things that are seen as very like, you know, consumer culture, like people see women as being the primary consumers in, in, in like capitalist society. And then like on the other hand, there's like male auteurs who are um, shaking everything up. So I really wanted to bring those together. And that's kind of why I think using images that are more pop culture can add a different element to text that um, might seem intimidating to someone who's looking at it for the first time, especially if they're a young woman. And um, if I could chime in on that too, uh, as a consumer of memes prior to starting my page, um, pages like What Meme Love You Long Time and um, a few other, I think Manic Pixie, meme queen and what some other accounts do in terms of that marriage of theory and taking low culture, low culture slash um, 
pop culture and uh, high theory and kind of integrating the two and fusing them into something um, that's relatable and new. Uh, relatable also not one of my favorite words, but um, that kind of gave me a little bit more confidence to make my own memes and kind of uh, step forth into a space where it didn't necessarily feel like it was very accessible before. Um, not that it was very like fearful ever, but it just kind of bridged certain gaps where I wasn't stepping from looking at, I don't know, like that boy and then making the memes that I'm making. There was kind of, you know, a stepping stone in that process where I saw the kind of memes that were being made and it, yeah, it definitely helped make what I make now. So, yeah. Speaking to something that I, I think, you know, obviously I can't touch on that kind of thing, but just speaking to the ideology of memes as such, you know, I think there's this, um, th there's the meme of the left cart meme. Now, I don't know what everyone's leanings are here, um, but anyway, so the left cart meme, and in some sense, I feel like there's a lot of left memes that can't strictly be considered memes. You know, it's the, also the meme is wall of text kind of thing. That's, that's my communism meme, which I horribly engage in whatever for. But I think then there's something you say, do memes engage in ideology? I would say, well, there's a, there's a structural economy, like, oh, there's a meme economy for, you know, to not speak of memes as mimesis, but there's a meme economy that I think shows something that pushes back on perhaps a capitalist realism. And this is, this is way out there in the sort of, we're being far too optimistic for memes. But I think there's, the, there's this like sort of diagrammatics or a sketch of of these of these movements that are, that are pretend, you know that sort of haunt this specter of a world that could be free kind of situation when you say okay these it, it, what the, the problem here isn't that we are producing these things freely and they're being distributed etc in in this in this fairly free for a way or the, the the only thing that slows up these flows is the maybe the resentment of the creator who go you know who i've been this person um who, who feels sick because of you know to link back onto the ownership of the meme like the, the, there's this i think the the structure of the meme economy is fundamentally um you know something to do with communism um so i think there's an ideology there and you know this um it's it's implicit uh rather than explicit i think so but i, I think there's a modeling there that shows that you know our desires um can work in that in, in that sort of productive sense like you know I'm, I'm happy to produce these things like i will do readings to make memes of you know authors that I really should be doing working on my thesis, but I will read to make memes because I think I sort of think this joke will be funny, and I'll do that. I'm not incentivized by capital. There's no speculate like not nor even social clout because I'm happy for that to run off. And you know, generally people don't, don't know who I am. There's not there's nothing to it. You know, maybe Dorian says something nice in potato chat, and I'm like that's lovely, but he might say something nice to me anyway. Like this so is not even really clout at stake here. So yeah, I think there's like a diagrammatics to a left ideology. Um, I should have just said that and walked on, sorry. I for one love the way that you speak and you should never apologize for it. <laughs> I think you've been voted in the chat as having the sexiest voice though. So I really appreciate that coming from you. Sorry. I, I, I appreciate both <laughs> your appreciation and the appreciation for my voice in the chat. I worked hard for it. Um, I think with ideology, maybe, maybe it depends on the meme, because I feel like Thousand Grigot is deliberate and extremely aggressive in the worldview that it presents, such that it's essentially identified with the worldview that it's presenting, whereas I think other pages that are maybe more freeform, please no one quote Zizek at me, I know everyone has ideology, it's all ideology, but my point is simply that I think some pages wear it more on their sleeve than others. And I think that someone put in the Q&A, they asked um, if we remembered what the actual origin of the meme concept is. Of course, it comes from Dawkins and the selfish gene. He's talking about how cultural evolution can outstrip genetic evolution. This confers on humans a particular advantage. The ultimate point is that memes are essentially units or replicators that pass from mind to mind and have an effect on behavior. And in that sense, they are necessarily ideological, if only in the sense that they preserve in their fossil records, so to speak, 
the ideology of the creator of the meme. Um, I know that this is going back to where we started with Beam of Elon Time and, and Yasmin, but I agree that the meme space, it does feel very, in a lot of ways, it, it replicates some of the issues of the academy as I understand them as an outsider. You know, I think like 80%, maybe 85% of my audience are male, according to my Instagram statistics. And I, that is something that troubles me because ultimately, you know, it, it annoys me when I go into a bookstore and all of the philosophy books by women have been relegated to gender studies or something like that, right? And then you go to philosophy and bloody Sartre has made his way in there. And no, I'm not taking questions on my hatred of being and nothingness. Uh, <laughs> but like, I do think there is a real problem in the, yes, emotions, things that interest women or people of color, et cetera, are relegated to critical theory or some subset of philosophy because they're not considered legitimately philosophical topics. Um, and I, I do think that that is something that I am glad that there are pages by people who haven't been theory brained like myself, <laughs> where they are addressing that and talking about that. And I think that's another thing we maybe miss when we say that memes can't be vehicles for genuine philosophical engagement. Because while that may not be true of ontology per se, it may well be true of political philosophy or thinking about things that pertain more to the social or the political. Abrupt ending to answer. I, I also saw that in, in the, um, the Q&A, there was someone asked about meme magic, uh, which is a concept which has been used before to talk about, um, it, it's kind of like, use the mainstream to talk about like hyperstition, you know, like a, um, a meme which eventually seems to prefigure reality. Um, and I think that that kind of maybe dovetails with what you were saying there, Meta, about how um, perhaps these, you, you won't be able to kind of like be able to do a, a, an ontology based off of, inter, uh, off of a, an interaction with, you know, uh, memes but you certainly are influenced in your uh political ideological uh position subliminally i think for most people i don't think well, i mean this was a this was a big um part of the discourse after the 2016 election you know the whole idea of the echo chamber and the, uh, the manipulation of, of uh, people's information by cambridge analytica and you know it became you know a international uh, problem of its own but when when you like look at it as like a macro social or a sociological phenomenon um, I mean it calls into question the internet as a whole far more than than memes although if you're going like I like that you brought in Dawkins because it does kind of give us maybe some uh, like prima materia to to really refer to when we're talking about what memes are which is you know like the proliferation of um concepts from one mind to another um it is very easy i think personally i can speak to having been uh willfully indoctrinated into certain political ideologies by an exposure to a timeline which is comprised of uh, agit prop, as it were, of a certain flavor, and it can vary. Like I was into the far, uh, far left uh, memes, which I, you know, I would probably consider a, a form of uh, of coping with political impotence now. But at the time, I very much let it, you know, be a substitute for actual theoretical uh, interrogation, actual rigor. And I do think that that is, you know, regardless of the major current or tendency uh, that of politics that you're being exposed to, if your if your biases are being confirmed continually in this kind of total flow way, which couples humor and wit, I mean, it's very easy to uh, to kind of subjectivize someone through memes. And uh, I mean, I don't 
think that I think that goes more for more mainstream meme discourse than whatever kind of esoteric niche little haven we've uh, carved out for ourselves here. But it is quite yeah, uh, that 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 idea of of um, I think it even goes back to what uh, Luke was saying or or Dor was saying before where you um, you take something through which it runs and then you and then you reproduce it and give it back to cyberspace or whatever uh, I think that, that you know this is in many ways how political memes work in terms of imprinting themselves that you know it takes from the the everyday of the meme viewer injects it with this idea which is then identified with and then you know it's it's shared or it's elaborated upon or it's you know uh, disseminated in some other form so yeah that's my yeah. i think thoughts. with the idea of memes as ideology too is kind of like like it, as a consequence of living in a man manufactured world i mean everything anything that you see around you is like that's our artificial someone has paid a large amount of money to put some kind of idea in your head or uh you know invoke some kind of feeling in you there's this thing where it's like nothing is like is made to look a certain way some just because i mean like a bottle of dasani like the s is a certain way because it's trying to like impart something upon you and like this happens either subconsciously or consciously but memes are no um or no exception. I mean, it's not really like a, in a point of theory to say that like whether or not like ideology can be spread through memes or the encapsulate ideology because this has already happened. I mean, if you look at like the election of 2016, the alt-right pipeline, or even like the growing insurgency of the left in the United States now, a lot of that has happened because of uh, the ideologues that you meet within your timeline through your memes. Mm -hmm. and, and the meme... <laughs> All right, I'm going to interject because we're out of time on this topic um, and we have not that much time left to get through things. So um, first, I just want to say, be careful with assuming that the analytics on gender of the identity of your followers is correct because those things are way off all the time. And yeah, so I would say not to trust it. Um, I always get categorized as male on all of those things. And um, um, yeah, and also complex. I was wondering how they would know that in the first place because there's no self-reporting of gender or anything on Instagram, so. Oh yeah, as a data scientist, I could tell you like our algorithms make mistakes like that all the time. Because we literally like base it off of stereotypes. Yeah, exactly, it's all stereotypes and you know, um, rigid definitions of things, so. Sorry, I just interjected on that. But the question I wanted to go to is something that's been brought up in the questions from um, participants and also relates to something that we have here. And it is about the parasocial. Um, so as a topic, someone said, I can't remember how they phrased it. It was um, talk about the parasocial and um, dialectics. And then um, in your discussions and in the document, there is uh, questions, uh, discussions about the parasocial aspects of running a meme page, a philosophy meme page. Um, how does the parasocial aspect um, work with prolifer proliferating, um, you know, does it proliferate philosophy through memes or, um, yeah, just how do you enter into thinking about this social and parasocial aspect. I just want to say that all of the friendships I have with people on the internet, total strangers, are genuine uh, friendships and none of this <laughs> in any way artificial. I love you all. I, uh, uh, yeah, it's not, none of this is false or, or, uh, or uh, yeah, it's, it's so, so um, in my, regular life and prior to owning a meme page i maintained about four friends and i'm quite the hermit i just generally don't really spend a lot of time chatting to strangers um however i now have 
a pretty large for a fairy page page and at least once or twice every week i will get a dm from someone that is just an a disappearing message i have to accept their message request and open the image to see what it even is now i don't do this <laughs> and um the messages i receive in general can be quite a lot each day from people saying, what should I buy? Will you please help me with titling my dissertation? Um, or even just a bit of a pouring out their heart about something that affected them about something that I made. These range from the endearing, which is the latter, to the unwelcome, which is someone asking me for help on their dissertation. Like, I don't know you from Adam. Obviously, I won't do that. And I do think that what that comes down to is that if you run a page that at least has a persona, even if it is not your own personality exactly, people do develop an attachment to it. They do feel a connection with it. And I think that that sense that they are someone on your timeline, just like the rest of your friends, I think necessarily kind of breaks down the boundary that historically has existed between theorists, not that I... I'm calling us theorists, but people who are involved in philosophical work and their, the audience that they have or will have, such that people don't even necessarily think it's weird to message a complete stranger and ask them for life advice or what they're up to or send them like a picture. Um, I definitely think we are dealing with a platform that breeds parasocial relationships so that it even works. I mean, at the end of the day, people wouldn't really attach to our pages in the way they do if they didn't feel, at least this isn't true of everyone, but for many of them, a personal connection. I think many of us personally cultivate it. Yasmin's entire thing is that that intimate feeling is a podcast revolving around intimacy. It is intended to produce a, at least a feeling of relatedness between the producer and the person who consumes. My own page is literally just me chatting really about something I've read today. Um, so I'm not saying people have misunderstood the platform in some way by developing a parasocial relationship. Um, but I do think that it can in some ways complicate what we're doing. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced wanting to post something and then maybe worrying about it because you don't want to upset your audience or someone that you are fond of seeing in your comment section normally. Um, but I do think that it's an important aspect of the meme page we don't acknowledge as meme page owners because it's just kind of part of the background. Yeah, I think that uh, I think the, the majority of us here are actually the, or, or maybe maybe half of us, uh, but our pages are almost wholly dependent on the existence of these parasocial relationships. I mean, uh, there, there are a couple of the pages here that, that just have the content and then maybe some kind of interactions come secondarily, but uh, there's uh, heavy abuse. I'm, I'm maybe the worst of them uh, of the, uh, like the question sticker on your story and stuff like that. Uh, giving people advice you should not be giving them kind of stuff. But why do you open yourself up? up? <laughs> What's that? Say, why do you open yourself up like that? It's it's funny. I, Dangerous. I, I love it. <laughs> I, I want to focus on someone else's bullshit instead of mine. Uh, but I mean, that's that's kind of what a lot of these uh, things are, right? Is is that people uh, want to build some kind of interaction with this uh, weird guy on the internet, guy or girl uh, on the internet, uh, and the person uh, on the meme page at least in, in, in my case, I'm interacting with the people so that I don't have to interact with my own life, right? And so both people are evading their own existences so that it can kind of exist somewhere in the middle uh, in this, this thing that's uh, arguably uh, entirely false. Uh, and it, it exists the same way that that exchange, that, that Ford Da thing happens with the, the exchange of memes and, and spreading all those things around where all of these things, they, they only exist because there's an interaction between objects or subjects or identities. Yeah, right, right. right. Uh, and, and the identities themselves, they don't have to be real. They don't even have to really exist so long as that interaction is taking place. Um, 
we could all very well be bots uh, feeding into this this kind of algorithm, and, and it wouldn't be all that different so long as uh, our vocabularies were wide enough. Uh, but <laughs> interfacing, yeah. So going off of the last question, I have a second question that is related to it. So I'm just going to throw it in there to like add it on to this one in case uh, this uh, if that, anyone wants to talk about this. Um, so I have uh, talk about the public participation aspect of this in terms of thinking about moderation, censoring, banning, and free speech. So there's a quote um, from the document, Grugo. Did I do it right? Grugo? Okay. That a free, is right. Right. A free quote, a free speech ethos is a good way to end up with an utterly fucked community. Talk about this. Basically, we have seen time and time again that failing to moderate your comment section leads to it being colonized by fascists. And oh, yeah. as someone who detests them down to my very core, sorry? I said, or leftoids or any type of, uh, you know, like tankies and MLMs, it, it really can, any kind of uh, distasteful uh, militant community, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I have um, a degree of contempt for tankies, but nowhere near as much as I do for fash. And I think that you can really just look at YouTube to see that they tend to be the ones who win a lot of the time. Tankies are good at colonizing Facebook groups, but at least anecdotally, I see fascists be very good at pushing everyone else out of the space because they're so toxic. But yes, at any rate, not moderating your comments section leads to at least unpleasant elements, um, essentially ruining comment quality. So I run a page that deals in eco-pessimism and a large number of people who agree with that are deeply reactionary um, <laughs> eco-nationalists or eco-fascists. And I found pretty quickly when I started out that if I didn't ban those people, they would rapidly turn my comment section into a just complete mess. But I think that a lot of people online feel goaded in some way into allowing free speech in their comment section. They want to be called out for like not being able to handle another opinion um, or getting triggered and getting rid of people, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's the wrong approach. I think that if you don't moderate, you are essentially making it impossible for anyone in good faith to actually engage with the content that you have. So I think it's possible. Uh, with this kind of, this idea of, of a censorious moderator, do you mean this just in the, uh, do you mean this as a discre at the discretion of the administrator, or do you mean this in the context of what you consider fascistic rhetoric? Because it seems like, you know, I mean, there's been on the left, this whole idea of deplatforming for a long time for anything which meets the criteria that is considered fascist at a given moment. So I'm just wondering if you're saying that this is something that like meme pages can do to stave off the black tide of, of fascists or, or is this just how to keep a page uh, vibrant? Just how to keep a page vibrant. I mean, you know, no platforming doesn't work because obviously these fascists already have their own platforms for spreading their ideas. Um, this is merely a question of keeping your own comment section from becoming complete shit. Uh, obviously, I don't ascribe to the view of you can just ban them out of existence. I just don't want them under my memes. Yeah, I, I mean, I... Oh, um, I think that I've found some ways to avoid those communities by the way that I self-brand, I guess. Like, I think that um, my story function has been kind of a central piece of my meme page in, like, getting people to look at my memes. And so I used to post kind of more, um, like, I guess more interesting content, like what films I was watching, like, when I was watching Gaspar Noé and stuff like that. And I think that certain kinds of content that I watch might be more interesting to people and then I would get all of these comments about Gaspar Noé and then I think that now I try to post like really boring stuff on my story like classical music and um, just things that are not really interesting that don't really 
rile people up so that the kinds of, I guess, my community is uh, more wholesome, I guess you could describe it, which also is kind of a limit too. But I, because I do wish that I could just post about what movies I'm watching without people like immediately trying to sexualize things that don't need to be sexualized. And um, yeah, but I, I think that now it's kind of a strategy just to make things more boring so that I can do content that I actually want without having to engage with like, um, I guess, intimidating or scary people. I think especially because um, I've seen that a lot of other female content creators and, and just like non-men have been dealing with like really scary stuff and like death threats even. It's, it's really, really scary, I think, especially for um, non-men online. <laughs> Um, so I would say that for my experience personally, say for one or two interactions, it's been overwhelmingly positive. And um, the whole ethos of my page in terms of uh, presenting these ideas that are kind of difficult to reconcile emotionally in some ways, and then leaving my DMs open for people to reach out to me if they're having, you know, difficulty or, um, yeah, they're just encountering a sense of like loneliness, maybe in terms of like considering these ideas in their own personal life and not necessarily being able to bridge those gaps uh, with people that they know um, in meat space has been uh, like one of my favorite aspects of running the page. Um, I think that I've made as much as those relationships can be called meaningful, some like really meaningful friendships and connections with people who um, we're kind of all in our like little pods right now, even more so considering the quarantine and we're kind of grappling with these ideas in unison, but um, even though we might be really uh, just located like thousands, thousands of miles away from one another and uh, it really redeems the whole endeavor as a whole. So it's, it really takes away from that feeling that I'm like shouting into a void where like my poor friends and family who are, you know, constantly on the receiving end of like my tirades. Finally, I'm like connecting with people who kind of have a certain, um, yeah, who are similar to me in like really meaningful ways to me right now. And I, I try to answer everybody uh, just because the experience has been so positive and um, kind of makes me sad that sometimes people are like, loathe to do something like that because it's like well these people are interacting with something that you've made on like a social platform so why would you askew any um interaction with them personally like what could i don't know yeah, yeah so as as much as i've been verbally shit posting about it i i do try to uh maintain genuine or semi-genuine relationships with the people that do reach out to the page. And generally speaking, it, it has been uh, pretty pretty wholesome. I have dealt with, uh, primarily it's it's the eco-fascists that pop up the most uh, in, in that kind of uh, worrying space. Um, but uh, I've found that interacting with every, I've, I've blocked some people, not that many. It feels good when you do it. Uh, but uh, I, I've blocked some people, but primarily I just try to interact with pretty much everyone, but giving myself permission to be as uh, uh, as cruel as necessary to them if they're uh, a, being a monster. Uh, and that seems to work pretty well, but it, it's, there's also that, I think there's the gendered difference that doesn't, uh, that makes it easier for uh, some of the accounts to do that than others. Um, How are eco-fascists even on the internet don't they like hate technology <laughs> no that's an archivist yeah that's some overlap but... and there is print spends 16 hours a day on the internet that's <laughs> an <laughs> on the internet 16 hours a day yeah friend makes fun of me for that one all the time yeah. <laughs> i mean i've personally i've made some very close friendships off of my meme page too um it was actually over the summer I made a very close friend. It was, uh, if not for the meme page, you probably would have never met. But like, we ended up living together for a good three or four months. So I've definitely like made like real personal connections. I mean, both online and like ones that have gone offline as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. One thing that's always been kind of a struggle because like I've at least like tried to like 
automatically censor people and say certain words that obviously shouldn't be said. But like, it's always, I think like I'm kind of in a more fortunate position that at least my page is big enough that like, it's very hard for fascists to really infiltrate and most of the time they get shut down almost immediately. But like, there's a lot of different like sub issues. Like one thing is like, and it's always been happening on my page personally was that like, uh, my female friends that would comment on that would end up having to stop commenting because it would be some random dude would like end up uh, trying to slide into her DMs or harassing her in some way. You know, all she was doing was just commenting on my page randomly. Yeah, I, I have to be more considerate about who I tag and what now for uh, similar reasons. That's, uh, internet's gross. <laughs> so, I'm going to go on. Um, I think we have maybe enough time for a couple more questions. I'm going to try to incorporate some more from the Q&A here. So someone brought up memes as interventionist art. And I had a question also about um, art and the creative process um, of making memes. So for me as an artist, I'm really interested in, you know, when I make something, I have a double process sometimes of art and also philosophy. But this is so specific of a practice. I'm really curious on how you are thinking about your practice. Is it an art practice for any of you? Is it a performative practice? Um, talk about some of the creative approaches that you have to making the memes or if you think of it strictly as a theoretical practice or you know, what's the kind of frame you would give it? I think the, the longer that I've been doing this, the more I've thought about it as an, as an art practice. And it began with thinking of it as an art slash writing practice. Um, and in, in this sense of, and because I can't help but, you know, link all of, you know, whether it's music or writing or visual art back to theory, it's going to be, you know, I'm constantly looking for how does the form escape itself through itself. And so this is my terrible way of saying, you know, I think philosophy escapes itself in some sense through, you know, abstruse memeing. But then, you know, I think what I've been doing now more than like making memes as such is, you know, walls of text and distortions um, that, you know, I'm in some sense, I like, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm very much like trying to see, like, I feel like I've already got the sort of Deleuzean, uh, you know, swarm process down of, or like, this is now my idea that now I'm doing Deleuze and Batari, but now I'm trying to like apply this sort of, you know, Deleuze's theory of, of Bacon and, you know, the, the, the contour um, and the color field to how, how do I deterritorialize that onto text? And this is only something that I've been sort of pushing with maybe over even the last month or so. But it's like, this is something that I've noticed about like my meme process has come in waves, much like my writing process. Like, you know, it's moved from analytic philosophy to philosophy to essentially theory fic. Now, how do I make that visual? And that's the next step. And I think it, it feels incredibly you know pretentious to, to say all this but i know that at home when i'm doing it i'm definitely thinking of myself in in, in terms of an artistic process and how do i you know what are the limits of the theory that i'm approaching this through and also can i possibly escape making art via theory that's that's like part of you know that some of them uh just more like sort of just blown out things that I'll just post and the caption will do the theory work. But I'm always thinking these are in relation somehow. And it's not clear to me how, but it's, it's a becoming, uh, you know, I'm thinking about it in terms of variations rather than relations maybe. So I'm not sure if that's clear, but I definitely have come to think of it as an art praxis. And, um, but it's, but it's impossible for me not to think of theory as an art practice in itself. I think, you know, once you're dealing with something like, you know, just reading, Deleuze, uh, reading A Thousand Plateaus might be an art practice in itself because it's always going to have at its core in this interpretive power going on. So, which I think is always at the, the core of like, as an artist, your, 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 um, your interaction with say the canvas is always the intervention. And this is the relation to the text as well. Like if it's creative, and this is my like Deleuzean dogmatism, if that can exist, you know, if I'm doing it, if I'm doing a creation and creating a percept or an affect, I'm definitely doing one art. So yeah, I, it's, 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 it's the same for reading, writing, and, and, and then, you know, uh, you know, digital manipulation or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. I won't apologize because Meta asked me not to, but I really want to apologize. 
Thank you for not apologizing. <laughs> I mean, I, so, so meaning, especially in a theory context, I, I feel like needs to necessarily be considering itself as art and as theory at the same time. I mean, they're pretty or ugly pictures that catch someone's attention and, and describe something to them. Um, but I also think that, uh, uh, I mean, theory and art are very, very tightly connected concepts to begin with. And I, in my own experience, most of the really good theory out there, the stuff that I find attractive is interdisciplinary. Uh, and most of the art that I really like is, you could call it interdisciplinary if you can say that art is literary, writing is interdisciplinary because it's also trying to make some kind of a claim about life or some kind of a, a denser statement or all the stuff that I said about poetry before and the, the way the meaning functions in that. And so it's, it's difficult for me to imagine um, a circumstance in which uh, we exist in this framework and we don't consider it in some way art unless we're just trying to avoid pretense. I do think that perhaps it connects back to the suit thing from earlier where people are afraid to describe what they do in ways that might seem to arrogate to themselves a certain right to be taken seriously because that invites criticism um, in a way that they don't want to leave themselves vulnerable to. I think that really, you know, this is my Heideggerian influence in that I think authenticity really is about the fact that if you are doing a thing, you care about the thing that you're doing. Um, you care deeply about the thing that you're doing in almost every case. And opening yourself up to criticism in that way can be difficult. And so the act of saying, disavowing in advance that what you're doing is art, that what you're doing is worthy of intellectual consideration or whatever, um, protects you from that potential pain of someone coming along going, you're a dumbass suit. Well, if you can say in advance that you are one, um, or if you can say in advance, I'm not really doing art, I'm just putting pictures and text together and uploading it. I think that's a way of shielding. It makes sense because obviously the field of Instagram discourse is bloody and brutal. Um, but I, I do think that even then, all you're really doing is concealing that you are nonetheless actually making art, um, even if you don't call it that. Yeah. Um, as to what you're talking about, like, you know, Art conveys a certain status onto a visual or other type of product. I'm saying product because these are all ultimately cultural commodities. Um, they circulate and create value. But there is, I don't know, there is a kind of sub subjective judgment that needs to go on, you know, whether you're expressing or not. Because I mean, if you think about the vast majority, or let's just consider the term content creator, which is a very term and which is almost tautological you know like you're creating content it's so vague that it doesn't have any pretensions to art but it also can encompass any type of internet uh, production that is going on and so if you look at like you know even if we so if we view like the scope of instagram outside of just memes themselves let alone the very niche and esoteric subgenre of philosophy memes and art. The vast majority is, you know, just clutter. And I mean, there's like a lot of people's lives. There's a lot of actual like authentic posting people who don't have the sense of irony, people who are literally just uploading videos and photos of themselves. You have extensive marketing. You have, uh, you know, extremely uh, broad arrays of content being produced. And to look at like, you know, okay, maybe there is some poesis going on, you know, like the, um, the act of, of, of creation for its own sake or for a sake which is outside that of the, uh, the utilitarian within our milieu. But I mean, I don't consider myself an artist. I don't consider the stuff that I make art because I think that um, 
I mean, obviously that like we, anyone who has even touched aesthetics kind of comes to the conclusion that this is all very subjective. Uh, but it's like, to me, I don't know, either, every, either it's all, either all of Instagram is art or it's all content, you know, content without that kind of signifier attached to it, or it's reproductions of art, you know? So it's like, um, yeah, I think ultimately this kind of like question, I mean, when we, when we originally had a, when we first had a call, we kind of were talking about how like, um, you know, you can have a philosophical experience of art with this kind of uh, meta commentary and meta language that it surrounds the f discipline of, of like high art uh, or academic art. But, and, and uh, Yvette suggested the idea that perhaps you could have a, something like an artistic experience of philosophy through these kinds of, uh, uh, me the, through this medium, through these uh, different cultural commodities. Um, I think that does kind of get back to kind of full circle to what, you know, we were talking about with the idea of, of the, of, you know, that, that whole food analogy um, or food metaphor about experiencing philosophy in like a very connected mode. Um, and is it an artistic experience of philosophy or is it a, an assemblage of, of symbols and signifiers which refer to philosophy but which don't actually have, I mean, to, to use the word content is, I mean, almost ironic now after going on a spiel about the vapidity and banality of, of the content creator in this, this category, which doesn't, seems to encompass everything and nothing at, at once. So I don't know, I'm more pessimistic about theory gram or philosophy memes being an artistic experience of philosophy. I think they're more, much more about in-group signifiers and things like that. Uh, touching on that, actually, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I, I, I don't have an art background, but I have a lot of friends who went to art school, uh, but I'm very influenced if by any art movements by Dada uh, and, and so the, um, the situationists and the, and, the, the, and the male art in particular, I don't know if, uh, but, but also like the, the method of the cut up method and collage, I don't know if you're familiar with male art. Uh, and these underground networks of people who don't consider themselves artists, they're anti-artists uh, against big A art, institutionalized art. Uh, and what they do is they send stuff through the mail and their collages and their, their ad impasses. Uh, you know, um, somebody will like, you know, take a picture, this is pre-internet, they'll take uh, something from a magazine and then they'll cut something up and then they'll put something next to it. In a way, uh, whether consciously or not, this has kind of like influenced my approach to memes because what do you do? This goes back to the ownership of, uh, you know, of, of memes. You see something and like, see a picture and like, wouldn't that be really funny if that was the losing Guattari and they were holding, uh, you know, whatever, a potato or something. Uh, then somebody else sees that and they pick up on it and they change it slightly. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that's, how memes are circulated and created uh, but yeah I, I very much with that uh that ethos myself anyway that's all i gotta say <laughs> well I, I yeah i think just to kind of like cap off what you're saying you know like the idea that, that there's an anti-art that's kind of what i'm getting at when i'm saying it's either all art or none of it is in that it's like to have like a uh a delineation or, or conferring the signifier of art onto like some of the the stuff that we make is, I mean, I'm, I'm all, as Bifo says, down with art, down with the distinction between art and daily life. I think it's also kind of oh. important to make a distinction between like what we, is it the meme itself that's art, like a particular meme that we post, or is it the, I guess, amalgamation of memes that a single person has uploaded, or is it just like theory gram itself, like everyone who is making memes about this particular topic? that's considered like a collective artwork because I think that people make different memes for different purposes. Like there are people who um, actually do brand partnerships and then people who avoid those. But then of course, we're all kind of partnering with brands in the sense that everyone sees ads when they're scrolling through Instagram. So I think it's, um, there's different layers. And I think that part of whether or not 
a meme or a conglomeration of memes as art depends kind of on intent. But I think also part of it is just the nature of the medium itself. Right, and also you can think of these, I mean, this is gonna sound horrible, but like, you know, you can think of uh, Deleuze and Guattari as a brand, uh, Ted Kaczynski as a brand uh, in some way or another, and you know, as, as a brand ambassador of, of uh, Hegel, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Someone once suggested that we um, print out the Doge memes I did about Ted Kaczynski and send him, send them to him in his supermax prison, and that idea simultaneously haunts me because obviously he'd hate them, and also deeply amuses me because obviously he'd hate them. And what I will ask the audience is: if any of you are Americans, please print out my Ted Kaczynski Doge memes and mail them to his prison cell, and then let me know exactly how long he tells you to shave for. Um, while ranting at you, uh, thank you. If any of you do this, I'll I'll shout you out. <laughs> um, maybe pick out some Q and A questions and answer them, or does the audience have the ability to speak and raise a hand? Oh, this is this is one that haunts me that I, I like a lot. I've, I've put a lot of thought into this and I don't have an answer, but uh, maybe someone in the group does. But uh, do memes fuel direct action or inhibit it as a pressure valve for libido? Um, That's option B. Probably option B, yeah. <laughs> I'm done being called an optimist today. <laughs> Oh, there's a question I really like. Um, so Clay asked, what is the significance of nostalgia and memes within these pages you have? How would that affect the psyche? So I think two things, like first of all, my memes tend to be um, kind of oriented towards nostalgia, but I think that also memes themselves are just nostalgic anyway. Like I guess some people are nostalgic for their undergraduate um, experience. Some people are nostalgic for like theory or a different decade. Um, and I, I can just interacting with other people is kind of nostalgic but I think that um so there used to be this concept of like the token dude that um black sheep memes started on Instagram and it was just the idea of I guess um the lost object or the um unrequited love um and I think that people started using that to get over their token dudes um but I think that I realized when I saw some like question posts that um, it actually just kind of perpetuated nostalgia and didn't actually get rid of this attachment, but just let it live on and people were bonding over it. And so they were kind of egging each other on to continue this nostalgia that can be productive, but I think sometimes cannot be productive. Um, and so I think that I've tried to abstract it into um, just like the nostalgia for internet culture more broadly because I found like that was more productive. I'm personally horrified by nostalgia. Maybe I've read too much Fisher, uh, but uh, the <laughs> I avoid nostalgia as much as possible. I mean, I fall prey to it because it feels nice, just like everyone else does. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I I do I do generally feel as if nostalgia in general is uh, uh, potentially incredibly toxic. Uh, I agree. I mean, I think that there's this whole like. You can't have genuine nostalgia on the internet. All you can have is a simulacrum of nostalgia. And I, I made a meme about this recently. It was basically like I was listening to this uh, Cuban Cuban music, which I used to listen to in my like very big socialist phase. Kind of it's called the Hasta Siempre Comandante about Che Guevara. And I was feeling something like something akin to nostalgia, like something like like a like a simulacra of solidarity with Cuban revolutionaries that have been long dead for over 50 years. And it, it just kind of came over me this kind of idea of, of you know, nostalgia as this very seductive force. I and mean, Jameson talks about nostalgia as being one of the biggest motivators of, uh, you know, the cultural logic of late capitalism, you know, being this constant uh, reframing of the past, this constant fleeing to 
the past. I mean, the left does that so much. All of its identity is uh, cobbled together from, you know, the Soviet Union, from, you know, the militant labor movement. I mean, obviously fascism is, is something which fetishizes a false nostalgia as well. Something about a, a past that never really, a past ideal that never really existed. So I think that, you know, nostalgia just as a, as a kind of, you talked about libidinal flows, as this kind of seductive, um, seductive tactic that's deployed, or, or not even a tactic, it's more, it's, it's a, you know, it's an affection that, or an affectation that we all um, are fa affected by variously. But it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, the, the internet is a, is a perverter and distorter of nostalgia. And it's, a, it's very, all it can do is prey on it as a, um, a way of manipulating rather than, you know, like the sweetness of a, of a true nostalgia, which is, you know, being immersed by the intensities of recollection, not just this kind of pang and, and even, even then, I mean, outside of internet culture, uh, nostalgia seems a little worrying to me because it's the constant relitigation of something that uh, can only ever be litigated more wrongly. <laughs> right? right? It's always going to be turned turn into something more horrible for you. I think we have someone here to ask a question. Uh, is that what is happening? Oh, I, I like, put a question in chat. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, so I, are you here to ask a question? Oh, um, well, my question was kind of answered um, already. Um, so that's okay. But I guess coming from that, that point of nostalgia, um, that, was, that was really interesting too, where it uh, tied back into a uh, like that meme magic, I feel like with the intent of it. And I see everyone talking in the chat, but I would like to ask kind of like, like would that in that way make memes like more of a dangerous thing than we would kind of interpret? Um, I think they can be, because I think they can be, I mean, even if we get rid of the you know, the description of them as dangerous, if we simply ask the question, are they capable of producing shifts in the way that people think and the things they believe? I think the answer is sort of evidently yes, that they have vectors that can change the way that people think and that depending on the particular significance of the meme. I thought it was interesting that Yasmin gave the example earlier of having created this ironic meme that was then appropriated by 4chan and these sort of various uh, groups that she, of course, doesn't, um, you know, does not side with in their beliefs. And it was removed from its original context and employed uh, as a piece of, if not propaganda, at least a, a circle jerk for them, not understanding the original sort of sarcastic intent. So I think that perhaps danger might be the it's a way that we could describe them, but it's it's more just a question of do memes have a kind of ideological virality to them? And I, I think the answer is definitely yes. And that's, I suppose, the essence of what meme magic would be. I... Sometimes memes could be used to like land dangerous ideas too. I mean, like if you look at the anti-maskers, for example, I mean, a lot of the anti-mask people, it's even like, I've seen like completely reasonable, intelligent people go like, wait a second, maybe this mask up isn't good for you. Like, even if even for a fleeting moment, but it's been used to like, you know, challenge narratives and you know, plant doubts and even like completely reasonable people about like basic ideas of reality. Good. I think the reason why like the idea of flat earth has spread so much in, uh, in the age of memes, you know? Well, I mean, I think that like, we can always look at these particular cases um, and these particular, like, like, bring in memes as an explanatory device for these sociological phenomena. But I think that what's more perhaps interesting is if you look at it from a civilizational perspective um, and, and kind of abstract from the particular towards a kind of general tendency about wh what the uh, connective mode and this kind of new language which is being born through meme culture implies for the future of an ever 
more augmented and, and mediated humanity or, or a humanity which is ever more mediated with its relationship to the world. Um, and this is one of Berardi's key points of pessimism is that, you know, as you have um, the ever increasing subsumption of embodied life by uh, the kind of techno-linguistic automatisms of the net, we become more and more entangled as subjects and then as, you know, as, as a kind of, he, he would even go so far as to like extrapolate into the future that, you know, this alienation, this crushing alienation, which is best embodied by our uh, disembodied experiences of being on the net, um, points towards a forgetting how to, or, or, or a change away from what he calls conjunctive relationships, which are relationships with other people which are, are fruitful, which are in person, which have an air of, of not romance in like a kind of uh, dualistic way, but romance as like, you know, a, a jeu de vivre or something like that, you know, like being with other people and being uh, able to have this ineffable kind of co-fraternity or whatever is being uh, slowly automated and more and more quickly. And, and I think, you know, I, I answered one of these questions in the chat earlier um, where they were, they were basically asking like what memes have to do with um, Berardi's wrote, has a book called Heroes in which he analyzes suicides and mass shootings and what the connective mode, the connective mode, you know, this, this way that we're all communicating right now, uh, what that does, how that interacts with, you know, just this kind of callousness for the other callousness, the, the, the ability to dissociate um, from the other people you're interacting with on the internet. So this kind of like, this ability to, uh, it, I think it engenders a big sense of solipsism an idea that you are the only thing that matters and the only thing that exists. Because as you interface with the rest of the virtual world, you are only your internet presence. So I, I think that memes are dangerous, not because you know it might spread right-wing ideology or it might challenge the CDC's narrative. I think that like on a much more, I hate to use the word spiritual, but on a much more spiritual level, there is something being automated and 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 lost something which is go which is going to be lost and possibly will never be recovered in the way that we know each other and care about each other as human beings so that's um, sorry just to that point um that strikes me as a nostalgia in itself like to worry of that loss is to is to to me in some sense to forestall the possible future. And I say, you know, to say, oh, our meme's dangerous. I might say, yes, a little, but have, you know, to do the, the Deleuze and Guattari line, you know, have we yet made them dangerous enough? Can we push through this flow? Because like my idea of the world to come sort of require, you know, this, and this is terrifying to, to some, you say it requires the end of this world. And now that's this world, meaning a world, not all worlds, you know, this, you know, I like Andrew Culp's line of, we move in philosophy now not to create concepts, but to destroy worlds. Now, this world strikes me as completely fucking untenable. Um, now, yet I can't have a nostalgia, you know, I'm, I can't be, you know, seriously anti civil and prim. No, but no. to say, I worry that I lose this because of what the techno, you know, what can this techno social body do is an important question. But we can change the socius in its relationship to the techno, which, the, you know, and techno will then morph in some sense. So, you know, I might say, um, I th saw someone post in the chat, you know, the left doesn't have the Koch brothers. And so this is an important element too. But so when I'm talking about sort of a meme economy as a diagrammatics for, a, for, for say a possibility, I say, you know, we have this ability to deterritorialize what is fairly conservative uh, platform that we are all on. Um, so I just think, you know, how do my interest here would be to, how do we make memes more dangerous now? And perhaps I speak from a huge place of huge privilege, um, you know, I don't feel endangered by, by fash or anything um, online that don't really interact or come for me, or whatever. I'm also, you know, a straight white dude. So, you know, there's all, all of that going on. But I think perhaps 
you know, it is this idea that how do we, I think, how do we make memes more dangerous without financial backing or et, et cetera, because they, they clearly have this indiscernible property um, uh, where they, they move between, you know, life and politics and culture, and they have the ability to territorialize on each, each of those in a fairly powerful way that the, in any sense, I think slowing that uh, is, I'm always going to say, ah, that's, we need to pull up because now we've fallen into an ethics of nostalgia, which is a, a, a little a little scary. I think that you know the acceleration and exacerbation of these phenomena is the only way forward as well. I mean, there, nostalgia is is kind of like a lugubriousness towards the past, whereas you know there don't, there is no going back. There's only going through. But I would contend. I, I think that I my point of contention here is that what you say that there is like a power in memes, and I think that perhaps in a certain way, but compared to other forms in which the the socius has mobilized in the past which had actual tangential or, or sorry not tangent, but had actual leverage like for example labor organizing which it, it belongs to one of those destroyed worlds that you're talking about uh, there's nothing that like a kind of cybernetic guerrilla warfare can do to kind of rival you know the, oh, the, the structural this, this isn't a this isn't a this isn't an either all of course this is an, an, an assemblage of mobilizations that, that completely you know enunciate each other they form their own expressions and contents that are in constant interaction like you certainly just i don't say we don't def we don't defeat um capital with memes <laughs> but they but they're they are a vector of movement within you know in, inside in, inside this enunciation um you know of you know of sorcery or what you know to to use a word that i really like and haven't used yet yeah so um yeah so i, I wouldn't say we don't need a you know a, a strong labor movement etc um you know, but also this might also be part, uh, it might actually be from a world that in, in, in this world may as well not have existed. Um, so I th this, this, this is, you know, I think a lot of what I say here is a pose of acceleration when it actually scares me a lot. And then I think I'm getting scared. P perhaps, perhaps me being scared of this is, the, is a sign that we're moving in this direction that's, you know, in some sense desirable, but also clearly only to, to me with my, <laughs> with, with my desires, which, you know, are informed by others, too. Um. I feel like it's, I think, I still <laughs> it's been, um, yeah, pretty intense two hours and really um, great conversation and the chat and the questions. I don't know if there's, um, a way to save them for any unanswered questions. Maybe you can write back to people for um, certain things that are left hanging. But um, I think it's time. I think it's them yeah. to wrap it up. And um, yeah, I mean the conversation is to be continued on ongoing. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for. Um, being a part of the conversation to the participants. Thank you to Foreign Object for hosting and um, any last words are from anyone. Thanks for managing us. It's nice yeah, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> it was fun. I'll second that. Yeah, gratitude. thanks. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Honestly. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining this. See you um, in the DMs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See you on the, on the parasocial. DMs. See you guys. Yeah. 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 Peace. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Beyond. I was I was lurking. <laughs> we can't continue now. <laughs> okay. See you guys. Bye bye.